Yeah, you know, we believe in the one that died for our sins and through him that we're saved. Is he Lucifer's brother or is he the creator of Lucifer? Uh, according to what you believe. Well, are we all children of God? No. No? I'm afraid I can't, believe, I can't agree with that. Okay. Well, if you're open to listening for a minute, I can explain why we're not all children of God. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm familiar with Mormonism's plan of salvation, plan of happiness, so pre-existence and all that. I'm just generally familiar with the subject matter. So, the main reason why, as evangelical Christians, we would say that we are not all literally children of God, number one is that God doesn't have a wife, Jesus and Lucifer are not literal brother. There wasn't a pre-existence with all the uh, pre-existent spirits in the heavens. So the purpose of coming to this earth is not based on a pre-existence, a mortal probation, an eventual So, what else would you say be becoming joint heirs of Christ here? Well, that's the leap from one subject to another. The, the short answer though, being a joint heir with Christ is being reconciled to God and being what's called justified. And being but justified is where you're legally time. recognized as being innocent of your sin. Because what scripture says is that God will judge the guilty. Yes. Oh, yeah. It is appointed oh, yeah. to man no, to live once no, and then no, after no, this no. is a judgment. So uh, from beginning to end, yeah, Mormonism yeah, and Christianity, God. they have different starting points. Well, he's, so no, all he's the steps that come after the starting yeah. point, even the conclusion of eternal destiny, it's totally different. So, getting back to why we're not all children of God, because we're not literal, like, descendants in terms of, like, the same species, if that's a good way to put it. Like, God in embryo, God in potential. But the Bible doesn't teach that we can become like God, and it doesn't teach that God... Because that's on the first page. God made man in his own image. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It doesn't say Heavenly Father and God is why. It doesn't say that, does it? Well, I mean, you know, well, he said that he made us in his own image, and so, you know, if he made Adam and Eve, it seems to me to indicate it. And another thing, too, is if you look in Genesis, the word it uses is Elohim, which is God's plural. And so, you know, I mean, if he's making us in his own image and it's talking about joint heirs, to me, an heir is someone who inherits what the Father has. And, you know, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to bring, I, I know you guys are out to do good things, and I, I'm having a hard time seeing, All right, take your time. <laughs> well, you know, no, just, no, I, no I was a missionary at one point, and so I just... Oh, okay. Anyway, um, yeah, no. Where, where'd you go if you don't mind me? I, I went to England, so it just seems to be... I don't know, I just... Camping outside the temple is just... I'm having a little bit of a hard time with that. It seems like you're out to catch us. Well, so let me ask you something about that. Paul well, I know Christ pre preached in the temple, and I, I right. know that's probably Paul what's going through your mind. It's just... But also, you guys come to our houses, right? Well, we come to your houses, but we don't go in, in your church buildings. We're not in the church building. We're out here. No, I, I know. I'm sorry. I'm... But, sure. but it, in all fairness, we have had people stand on the sidewalk. By our church. Okay. I, yeah. I was unaware of that. But fair, fair enough. It, it's okay. It, it's uncommon, right? But, but the point is, is that we're, we're not out here to, like... Or to, you know, we're not like stopping people on the way out of the temple. Hey, come talk to us. We literally want to just yeah. have a conversation or yeah. hand them a piece of paper, and that's it. Yeah. Um, so, like, to, to be clear, we're Christians. We love more. Well, well, we're we all, we're both Christians. I would disagree with you. Well, that, but uh, let me that, tell you why. To, just so that you understand where I'm coming from, because I, I can understand why that would be offensive and inflammatory if I don't qualify at first. Is that fair? That's. Fair, but I... uh, okay, so let me qualify that just real quick. I've alluded to it a little bit already, but according to the Bible, in John 1, verses 1 through 3, in Colossians 1, it says that Jesus is the creator of everything that ever came into being. Everything. Whether 
visible or invisible principalities or powers, people, spirits, literally everything, categorically. Jesus created it all because he's eternally God. But according to Mormonism, what Joseph Smith thought is that Jesus was not always God. He's the offspring of Elohim, one of his wives, our elder brother, and he's the brother of Lucifer. So immediately we we use the same word. We, we both say Jesus, but there's a prologue that's added to the identity of who Jesus is. And that fundamentally changes who he is. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, but don't you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the Father too? I mean, John three sixteen. I mean, it's kind of difficult to argue with. But... That, so, where where I would agree, I would say I affirm what the verse says. Where we differ is the usage of the word Son. I don't understand that to be teaching a literal parentage, as in like father son. Like I have a daughter, right? So when I say she's my daughter. Which version of the Bible? If you don't mind me asking, are you King James? Um, uh, I have NASB. Um, oh, we, we have yeah. no problem with King James. It's just the one I had in my car. I pull it out every time I come yeah, here. We, so. we have King James uh, on my phone. I have King James NASB. Oh, the, the word the King James version uses, and I, you might have to call me on this, but I believe the word is begotten. Huh? And that, so you, you know what begotten means in the original language? Uh, I'm just curious. No, well, begotten means just parenting. Okay. It's actually a title. It's not speaking of parenting. It's a title. What it is in the Greek is the monogamous theos. He's the unique and one of a kind. It, it is a title reserved only for Jesus Christ. That, that's why we call him the begotten. No one else qualifies because because he's unique, right? There's not more than one Jesus. Can we agree on that? Yeah. Yeah. So there's only one Jesus, as the Bible teaches him. But what it teaches about him is that he's not our big brother and. Know, that, that's why we would say fundamentally that's like the number one issue yeah. of why when you know a faithful Mormon such as yourself I would have to say lovingly that I couldn't break bread with you as a brother in Christ because what you profess about him is different. Does that make sense? Well, if you can't break bread with me, I mean Christ broke bread with the you know, Republicans and the sinners. So. Well, I think we're maybe talking uh, communion I, I, here. I mean in terms of like a spiritual brother. That, that's what I'm talking about. It, it doesn't mean that I can't love you as a person and be like, hey, let's go get lunch and have a talk about stuff. That's not what I'm saying. I, I'm saying that I couldn't identify with you as us being on the same page spiritually and saying, yes, we are both Christians. We both have the same essentials, same God, same Jesus, same God. Does that make sense? So uh, we come out here because we love our Mormon viewers. And we just want to, you know, talk about the differences and say, this is why we're so learning for you. Because we had God's revelation, and then Joseph Smith comes along, you know, 100 years later, and he adds things, and he changes teachings that were already clearly established in the Bible, and he says, it's not this, it's that. So as an example, um, the Bible says, you know, before me there was no God form, neither shall there be after me. Joseph Smith taught that there were gods before God, and that you could become one God. So what we say as Christians who are concerned, we say, this is clearly a contradiction. This is clearly evidence that he was not speaking in agreement with God's word, but rather he was contradicted. So in Deuteronomy 13, it says uh, about prophets, God gives a test to the people, which is really great. And he says, here's how you know for sure. If the prophet does not speak according to the law and the testimony that is previous revelation is revealed in scripture, even if they have signs and wonders, so maybe we think of that as good fruit. Maybe everything looks legit. Maybe they even have miracles. And stuff. If they teach other gods, if they say, come follow after other gods which you have not known, then you know they're a false prophet. And then it goes on to say, don't listen to them. And it also says, the Lord your God has tested to know whether or not you love him with all your mind, mind, and heart. So the question that I would have for you, sir, is how do you know that you're obeying that command right now by affirming Joseph Smith's and, and I'm assuming you would. Am I wrong? No, I would. Okay. So w would you say that you're fulfilling that command? Maybe because Joseph taught a different idea about who God is? And just use the different Jesus's background. Yeah. If that helps clarify it. Oh, no!
Well, to us, to us there is one God, God our Father, who worship him. But, but, but is he one God among many gods? Like, like, is there more than one being? Oh, Genesis would say so. So, is it one or is it three? I feel like we're getting tripped up on something. Well, so, so you say one God, but... Well, but, we worship one God right. through the Son. We worship God the Father through the Son. Sure, but you acknowledge, at least Mormon John, who teaches that there is more than one God in existence, correct? Right. Okay, so it's not one God, it's that there's three gods, but you choose to focus on one, correct? Well, it's not really the way we think. We think about worshiping the Father, we need Christ to tell him that to do it, and then we need the guidance of the Holy Ghost to know what's true. In but you wouldn't worship the Holy Ghost or Jesus, no. right? Yeah. Because they're, they're they're not the God of focus. The Father is the God of focus, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what we would say about that is that Mormonism is polytheistic and that they acknowledge there's more than one God. We believe the Bible is strictly monotheistic and consistently teaches that there's only one God by name. Only one. So if there's more than one, that means that the professor of the polytheism is not monotheistic and therefore it can't be Christian. Because what God says about himself is that I alone am God. There is no other. Does that make sense? So could, could you see why, you know, as a Christian we would say we're a little concerned about that because I hear what you're saying. We only pray to the Father. We only worship him. He's the only God of the earth with whom we have to do. But this is where the identity was changed by Joseph, where he says instead of a, a triune God or a Trinitarian being, three in one, they're Unitarian, and that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are three separate beings, which makes it tritheism or polytheism. Oh, and, but you have an issue with that, considering when Jesus was baptized, they were all yes. three there. Yeah, I, absolutely. But we don't have an issue with Jesus' baptism because we believe what the Bible teaches consistently is that there's one God and that he's revealed through the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But we believe there is one who, or one, one what, God, three who's, Father, Son, Spirit. What Joseph said is there's three who's and three what's. God the Father, God uh, the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. That's what he taught. In the King Paul Discourse, he said, you know, according to sectarianism, they're all to be crammed into one God. It would be a giant, it would be a monster. I say that's a strange God anyhow. Here, here then is the truth, that they're separate. And then he also says, God was once a man like us, and he learned how to become God, and you have to do the same thing. That's a different message than what God testified about himself in Isaiah. In, in Isaiah 43, 10, I, I quoted it earlier, where he says, Before me there was no God, neither shall there be after me. But Joseph said, contradicts that. Right? Or, or am I missing something? Feel free to correct me if I'm overlooking something. No, I mean, well, let's talk a little bit about the oneness, because there's, there's a scripture in the Bible. Um, Christ is kind of talking a little bit about how Let's see if I can find it. Sorry, okay. well, I remember a little bit of the phrase. No problem. Um, while you're looking that up, when you say oneness, what, what do you mean by that? Well, Christ was talking to his apostles, and I'm going to see if I can't find it. But it, what he essentially said is, "Let you know my apostles be one, as we are one." And he meant unity and purpose. John 17. Yeah, he's singing the John. Yeah. Yeah. So in John 17, um, that's I'm not sure. Maybe you can help me. What are you looking to establish there? I, well, it talks about the kind of unity that exists. So, um, yeah, so verse 11. It's And this is NASB, so I'm just, you know, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, right? And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. All right, well, he doesn't didn't talk about the apostles being indistinguishable. They're still separate people. They're united in purpose. Right, but, but it would be improper to somehow associate that as uh, some sort of declaration about the nature of human beings. Because that's not what it's talking about. It, it's not a comparison of uh, the Godhead versus the church. Because Christ is the head of the church. So the unity of the church in context 
it was going to be Christ, the head of the church, and then his bride, the church, having unity in that way and being known by their Savior in that way. It, it's not talking about like the, the sort of like, oneness uh, where, where they're one in purpose, but they're distinct. God, God made creation, human beings, to, to be very different from the Creator. He, he doesn't have a wife in heaven. He, he's not a man. I, I understand where you're coming from, but okay. to me that kind of contradicts with God made man in his own image. You know, if you, you call your kid after your own image, it's because they eventually have the potential to be like you. You see God, the Father, the Holy Ghost, and the um, and Jesus Christ, all present in his baptism. We have the indication there that, you know, they intend for the apostles to be united in purpose, but, but you know, they're not going to become indistinguishable. I don't know what the equivalent would be for the 12. Probably, you know, trying to be, but, you know, I, I'm afraid I'm a Mormon through and through. Yeah. So, you, you know, going back to Genesis, it doesn't indicate anywhere in the text that God made us to be little gods. Because you use the phrase, he made us in his own image. I, I'm wondering, you know what the historic Christian understanding of that is? I, like if I asked you, could you tell me what a Christian believes about that, what would you say? I, I'm not well versed on what everybody else would think about it. But. Okay, so if it's all right, let me just explain that real quick. We don't understand that to mean like uh, a literal progeny, right? It, it's not a posterity kind of thing, right? It's not father, son, and so on and so forth. What we understand the image of God or the Imago Dei in the Latin to be is that God has what are called communicable attributes. So things like God reason, love, morals, ethics, beauty, rationality, all those kinds of things, they reflect the thinking, mind, creativity of God, and He has bestowed those things upon His creation. And so, in that way, mankind is the crown jewel of creation, because the other creatures on the planet, they don't have minds and intellects and immaterial spirits like we do. We're unique in that way because God created us to have relationships with Him. That, that's our purpose. We were created to enjoy God and glorify Him forever. That was the purpose of creation. So when the Bible teaches that God made us in His own image, that's what it's talking about. Now there are certain things, what we call non-communicable attributes, so things like omniscience or being all-powerful, omnipresence, being everywhere, all you know, simultaneously. We don't possess that because we're not God. Right? So there's a distinction there of some things that are communicable to creation because we live in God's world. So naturally, the rules of the game, so to speak, are set and limited by God and His creation. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that's, that's kind of like one of the, the things that I guess we would struggle with is there's there's nowhere in scripture, and obviously there was a lot of theology there, but there's a lot of history that comes with that interpretation, and we would say it's consistent with the entirety of scripture. There's nowhere in scripture where it says we're, we're going to receive these incommunicable attributes that only God alone possesses, you know, all-knowing, right? Um, you know, being omnipresent all places at once. Um, these aren't things that Jesus promises to the disciples. These aren't things that God promises to the prophets in any way. It's not something that is a gift to the Holy Spirit that we receive. Uh, we receive other things, but um, there's nowhere where it says that we're going to have all of those God-like attributes one day in Scripture. And that's that's kind of, I guess, where we, we do struggle. And, um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, you know, like from a personable standpoint, I, a lot of people do like to focus on similarities to be able to relate to one another. And I think at the end of the day, you actually are able to understand where you stand better when you figure out where you differ with people. And I think in this instance, I, I think um, understanding where we're coming from and where you're coming from, we really like focusing on those differences to see where we're at and then look at what is scripture, what does it say about how we should relate um, to our God, right? That's going to be the standard we go to. And so uh, I guess, like, yeah, that is something, like, that would be a struggle for, like, how we relate that. I mean, do you see anywhere in Scripture where we're going to receive those God-like attributes of omnipresent, all-knowing, um, anywhere in God's Word? Not really beyond what I've just mentioned. Yeah. Okay. So, well, 
Would you say that you know a little more than maybe what you did at the start of the conversation in terms of maybe just no, some no, of the differences? No, sorry, I, I don't mean to be antagonistic. Or... You're not. You're actually really nice. So please don't think that we, we didn't think that. You're probably the least antagonistic Norman I've talked about. Seriously. <laughs> I had someone swear at me last week. Yeah, he no. said he was a Mormon. No, you're, you're, you're well, Christchurch had Judas in it, so if we don't live up to our ideals, I apologize. I got that, yeah. He was very kind of you. Yeah. So, no, but, uh, but the one thing, you know, we would want to leave you with, and I would really encourage you to, to take this and think about it, because another area that we differ is on grace. And not only is the identity of Jesus important, but how we come to know Jesus is equally important. And, when, and in Mormonism, there's a different understanding of grace. So in the Christian view, and, and I say Christian, I mean evangelical Christian, right? just, just to be clear. In Christianity, what we teach about grace or how to be made right with God, it's not that the atonement makes us savable, and then we have to be obedient to the laws and ordinances of the gospel in order to receive it. We don't believe the Bible teaches that. What we do believe is that God does something really beautiful. It's called justification. Romans 5, 10? Is that the scripture you guys talked about? Uh, um, Confess with your mouth the of Jesus. That's, oh, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. that's yeah. Romans um, uh, 10, verse uh, 9. Yeah. Okay. Romans, oh, yeah. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord yeah, and so believe that God raised so him from the dead. That's part of it. But going six chapters earlier in Romans 4, there, there's a really beautiful passage. Uh, do you have the Gospel Library app? Wow, you guys do know us well. Yeah, yeah. I, I have it on my phone too. It's really great for uh, looking at verses on the fly. Uh, so if, uh, you can look at Romans uh, 4, verses 4 and 5. If you just want to read that real quick. Now, to him that worketh, the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of death. To him that worketh not, but believe upon him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay. So, what do you think that means? <laughs> and if you need to read it again, it's totally fine. Um, five shoes. Uh, you know, save ourselves. Uh, Paul was the one who said that you know, because we're covered by grace, should we sin? Or should we sin? But just because yeah, grace, should we, the grace may abound. Yeah. You guys know it. Yeah. So I would actually fist bump you on that. I agree with the Apostle Paul, where if we purposely take advantage of grace, to do sin. God condemns them. So you and I would have a point of agreement there, but that is an unrighteous or a sinful thing. Yeah. Well, and I'm not insinuating that you guys take the viewpoint where you've been okay. saved so you can do what you want. My, my argument to that would be is, have you really been converted if you know, your, your behavior hasn't changed? Amen. No, that's a good question. And I think like looking at the whole of scripture, because you know, I have a conversation with my brother about this, about like, well, what about people? I, I really thought they were saved. I, I think scripture does speak to that. In First John, it says, um, you know, they went out from us because they were not really of us. Sure. And um, so th there are people that obviously may seem to possess grace well, from our perspective, but yeah. Would scripture... you guys say that salvation is an instant then? Because, you know, I, I think it's much more of a process. I mean, you have Peter who was with Christ for three years, but, you know, the, right before he was crucified, well, he denied him three so, times. I, I would... And so it takes, I feel like it's, a, it's never, it's all very seldom an instant. I mean, you, taking another example, David from the Old Testament, he had a fantastic start but he you know tripped up there and so i don't i don't know if that's a I great that's a great that question salvation is a status that you you know you can stamp yourself on and say that i'm i'm good to go i've got it that's a okay. it's more of a continual real, real process uh, could, i know that um, in the church there's like six definitions of salvation so could you just clarify real quick like do you, do you mean salvation in the fullest sense, yeah. like exaltation and all the rest? Yeah. Is that what you mean when you say salvation? Oh, yeah, it's a process. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's the reason, like, that's a good question he asks, because when we say salvation, what does it mean to be saved? There's many ways that scripture speaks about that, and there's many words in the original language to sort of parse that out, right? So you have 
justification, sanctification, and you have glorification. Those are three big things that are spoken about in Scripture. And all of those, Paul may use, we have been saved, we are being saved, we shall be saved. Those language is used, and I would say salvation encompasses all of that. Um, the question I think that's really important is, is justification something that happens at a particular moment? Um, do you have a particular view on that? Because that, that's where I would maybe say... Justification, can you explain that? Yeah, so justification is actually what we were just talking about in Romans 4. So this is the NASD, it's just a more modern English translation from 1995. So in here, you know, now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but what is due, right? So if you think about that like a paycheck, you earn what you get, that's your wage, right? You put in hours, you get your wage, it's not a gift. Conversely, but to the one who doesn't work, but believes in the hand of God, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited to righteousness. So, justification in Christian theology is essentially, it's God covering the person in the blood of Christ, and it removes their debt of sin, permanently. So, if you think about it in financial terms, right? You, you have a credit card, you're, you're born in sin, and your balance is so hopelessly in the negative. There is no way you can even inch your way up to pay any of it off with any of your good deeds. Because what the Bible says about our good works in Isaiah 64, 6, it says our good works are like filthy rags to them. And in the Hebrew, oh, sure, that's in our theology as well. Right, right. And in the Hebrew, it actually goes a step further and it says it's like an unclean menstrual cloth, or you can think of it as a dirty tamp. That's how God regards our and I say our as in you and I, fellow, you know, brothers of men, he regards our good works in that way. Meaning, we don't earn favor with God. We don't earn forgiveness. We don't earn grace. And we don't earn justification, which is God basically taking the spot before the Father. So, so Jesus stands before the Father and says, this person innocent because he's covered in my blood. That's what justification is. So we would say there is a finite point in time where when someone is justified, where, where they do believe the promises of Jesus in the Bible as they're written, and they trust in God for a, a true forgiveness, and they stop striving, they stop trying to earn favor, they stop trying to earn their way into heaven. But instead, what they do is they put on a parachute, right? as they're getting ready to go skydiving. And, and in this metaphor, skydiving, everyone has to take the jump because we're all gonna die. So the question is, how do we put on the Lord Jesus Christ? How do we have that parachute for the jump? Right? And according to scripture, what it says is, right here, the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly. Who's the ungodly? Us, right? We're not inherently godly. And People who are ungodly, they do ungodly things. That is, they sin, right? And sin incurs a debt. And what it says in Romans is the wages of sin is what? Remember? Death. Death, right? And, and that's in verse 3. So, or uh, chapter 3, and then in chapter 4, he talks about, you know, the wages are not credited as a favor. So if we earn death, that doesn't mean that we earn life. Right, because we're not doing anything in our life, we, we can't. So that's why it has to be a gift. And in Mormonism, it, it's actually different. It, it's, there is an emphasis on works. At, at the very least, in order to be saved, here's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, you have to have faith, repent, be baptized, have the laying on of hands to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and you have to keep your covenants and ordinances, and you have to endure the end, correct? Oh yeah, I mean, well, what, what you're in... I'm going to bring up John 3, 5 here. Um, unless a man be born of water and of spirit, he can in no wise inherit the uh, kingdom of God. And so to me, that you ought to be baptized, right? So we, we agree, but where we would disagree is what the purpose of baptism is. We, we don't believe that bad, that the act of being baptized is what removes your sin. What, what we believe right here... No, it's like, you're not, you're not necessarily removing sin, but let's, let's put that aside for a moment. He says, unless a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he can in no wise enter into... This is when he's talking to Nicodemus up here. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me to indicate that you, you got to get that done. Oh, okay, good question. So right here in Romans 4, verse 3, Paul is making the argument about Abraham, the father of the faith, okay? He didn't have baptism. He didn't have any of those words. 
And he says, what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So, getting the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ credited to our account, that comes from faith. It's not faith and baptism because Abraham was never baptized, was he? Josh and Barbara. Well, the only way we could say he could is to make an argument from silence. Right? In other words, to argue something that we don't see in the text, but we're assuming and inserting it. I, I'm, I'm saying we don't really know one way or the other, and so I'm not prepared to sure, sure. take a side on that. Right, so... Well, you could look at a lot of the... I mean, John the Baptist was doing baptisms before Christ came around. And a lot of the Hebrew washings are... No, I know that comes from the Law of Moses, but a lot of that was symbolic preparing for the baptism that, you know, John the Baptist is going to do sure, Christ the Christ 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 the the yeah. yeah, I mean, cleansing and all there that. There you go. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, it's similar. And yeah. So I don't, I don't know, if, I'm not well versed enough to, you know, figure out exactly what did or didn't happen. Yeah. But, so, um, j just to be clear, we think baptism is a good thing, and we believe that those who profess faith in Christ should get baptized. Well, I mean, how, how do you reconcile that? It says born of water. So, so, like, that's a really good question, right? I, I don't know. Are you familiar with any other interpretations of that verse? Or are you familiar, or are you only familiar with the, you must, that means baptism only? I, I've heard other interpretations, have, but I can't Have, have you read much of hand. Ezekiel? So it, it, I think, are you talking, yeah. like, Ezekiel 37? Is that what you're hearing? Uh, um, so in Ezekiel, you, you see a, a cleansing of the heart, right? There's a, a replacing the heart of stone with the heart of flesh. And there is a, 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 a water cleansing of the heart that occurs under the new covenant that we see, right? And so the way I would interpret that verse, and I would say Craig would too, is that we, we don't see that speaking about water baptism because Jesus doesn't mention it in the text. He's talking about being born of water and the spirit. And we would say that the water that you are born of is the, is the cleansing that happens by the washing of the spirit when we become saved through the work of the spirit in our life. Uh, and so, and then that, that I understand that might be a new interpretation to you, but I, I always like to look at all of Scripture, right? Because we should read, see Scripture as something that is God-breathed and is consistent throughout. And in 1 Peter 3.21, um, uh, it says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. So I like to bring this up with some of my friends that do believe that baptism does save you. And um, looking at that one, right, if you just stop there at that verse, it says, now baptism saves you, right? But if you keep reading, it says, not the removal of dirt, from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the salvation that occurs is not the water in and of itself. In fact, it has nothing to do with that because Peter says it's an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection, right? So it's appealing to the salvation that we have because of a Christ. We're appealing to Christ. Again, that's something that's credited to us through belief in the one who justifies the ungodly. And that's right. the way well, I, mean, that, like, I guess taking a step back there, um, you know, before Christ came, there, there was the law of Moses. And as part of that, as part of the repentance process, oftentimes for certain things you have to, you know, sacrifice, and like the altar lamb. That actually doesn't save you. I mean, the, the sacrifice, yeah, that, that, but it was necessary because God asked us, asked the Hebrews to do it. We don't have to do that now because, you know, that law has been fulfilled. But I don't think it's so unfair to think that baptism might be, you know, viewed in a similar light. Does the water save you? No, but he asked us to do it, and so it's required. Right, but, but according to Mormon doctrine, it is part of a multi-step process for the remission of sins, correct? Oh yeah, we're baptized. Right, so that would be a, a point of difference for us, because what we would say is that you don't have to be baptized to get credited for the righteousness of God. That, that's like the main distinction we would make, but at the same time, it's, it's not like the main issue you know, we would want to really like kind of have a disagreement over per se. Does that make sense? Like the, the baptism issue is meaningful, but the most important thing is who is Christ and how do I come to God? So, you know, going back to the grace thing in Mormonism, you have to earn the grace. Well, it's by grace when we were saved after all we can do. I'm sure you know that's for sure. Sure, sure. But so you'd say that grace then is, is something that we have to work towards, right? But Well, I'm saying if God, Christ offers you a gift, you, you I mean, you have to do, and you guys believe this on some level too. I mean, Christ's atonement covers everything, but you have to believe in him for that to do you any good. We have to have faith in the one who justifies the ungodly, yes. Sure, so isn't that something? Is well, it a work or is it? Not necessarily. Well, you can't manifest faith. I mean, you cannot, 
Well, I mean, you can profess to believe in Christ, but if you do not do good things, in my mind, you do not believe in Christ, because if you believed in Him, sure. you do good things. Yeah, we, we agree. So, to, to maybe give an analogy to help clear this up, what we say is that faith is the root, not the fruit. Right? So, faith precedes the good works. So, someone who has a real faith, it's going to show in the fruit that they display in their life through, through well, their works. These, because these things are inter interlinked. I mean, if, as you do more, you become more like Christ. Sure. and your faith in him strengthens you can't you're not going to come to know christ without doing his works okay so paul would reject them and based on that text that's right here where it says now to the one who works his wage is not credited as a favor but what is due and then again but to the one who does not work does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly his faith is credited as righteousness so in Mormonism, I think it's Moroni 1032, let me know if that's wrong, where it says, we have to deny ourselves of all ungodliness, and then the grace is credited to us. Do I have that right? No, he's, he's exhorting people, I would exhort you to. But, but it's an if-then statement. It says, uh, if you deny yourselves of all ungodliness, then... Grace. You can't receive the then until you've done the if. Right. And so that if is a requirement to get the then, right? Do you see why we would say we have a difference there? Because that seems like an issue for us. It, remind me, what, what was your name again? I'm sorry. Uh, Craig. Sorry? Andrew. And Andrew? Jacob, Craig. Yeah. So let me just say, I can't earn grace. I know I am a rotten sinner in my heart. I know I have a life that is painful on my past. I know there is no way, any day out of my life, that I could possibly ever deny myself of all ungodliness in word, thought, deed, and even in my emotions. Do, do you think that you could do that? Well, I mean, I, I look at um, Matthew 5:48, which says, "Be therefore perfect, as my Father in heaven is right. perfect." I, Are we going to be right. able to do that on our own? No, but we should. It's something we should strive for, and as we do that. Are we not going to be rewarded by becoming more Christ-like and an increase of faith? Good question. Um, the answer would be no, and I'll tell you why. The, the, the problem is, in the present, we already have sin behind us. So if Jesus says, be ye therefore perfect, he's not saying, be ye therefore perfect in the future. He's basically stating in the present, be ye therefore perfect. So if perfection is the standard, it means we have to be perfect from start to finish. So from our past to our present to our future. Which I failed. And, and that's the problem with well, we, all, we all have. But like looking at the whole chapter of Matthew verse 5, he gives a whole bunch of, you know, if blessed are the poor in heart. Or, yeah. like, he gives a whole bunch of promises that are set, set in if-then statements. If, sure. you know, if you're meek, you'll inherit the earth. And there's, there's a whole bunch of other ones that I'm not able to recall. Uh, I need to study more. Yeah, but, you're thinking about the Beatitudes. But right. But aren't those similar promises? So to me, that's... In the same line as Christ promising that it's it's not an if command, right? So he Christ is stating what is going to happen to the peacemakers, what is going to happen to the poor in spirit, and the question we have to ask is how are we able to do that? And our basis is we we believe it's going to be from the root of faith, not the fruit of faith that we work out, because again we're saved by grace, which Paul says in Romans eleven six, which is later in the book. For if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So I always like that verse because at the end of the, that, that defines grace really well. And it means you can't put works into it. And, well, uh, is it, but works are still important. I mean, if you read the book of Revelations, it says that the book of life, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Works are really important, yeah. Is the book of life is going to be opened and, you know, he who doesn't do good works is not going to not going to have a good time. He's going to have to say that. Yeah, so what we would say about that is in, in Ephesians 2, it, it talks about how we're saved. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, it says, For it is by grace you are saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. It is a gift, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. And then in verse 10, it says that we were foreordained to walk in good works. So what that means is the good works that those who believe in Christ do, it's something that God already pre-planned and foreordained and are driven by the Spirit of God that is present in the believer. So God gets the credit for the salvation of the person, for perfecting their salvation, and for even the good works that they do in His name, for, for the true believer. 
So it's not that works are purposeless. It's not that works are something that we wake up in the morning and we have a to-do list that we check off, we need to pray, we need to read, we need to serve my fellow man, and so on and so forth. In order to obtain or maintain a good standing with God, the Bible doesn't teach that. What it teaches is that those who have been saved by God, saved past tense, but also presently, we have been saved. If you're trusting in Christ, you are already justified. What, what that means is you don't have to go to bed at night wondering whether or not you're worthy enough of the grace of God. The Christian can truly say, I, I can declare to you, Andrew, I know that the grace of God has been credited to my account. And I know that if I were to die tonight, you know, God forbid, I would be with him. In Mormonism, however, there is a set of requirements to be faithful to the laws and ordinances of the gospel, endure to the end, keep your covenants, get married in the temple, raise a family, all that kind of stuff. These things are required in pursuit of exaltation, correct? Yeah. Right, like to, to get the highest degree of glory, right, the third degree, those things really are kind of required, right? Sure. Yeah, so it, in terms of like where we stand, as Christians, we, we say, you know, we see that there's this huge divide here, and the divide fundamentally is who is God and how we come to know Him, and having a proper understanding of grace is super important, because like this verse in Moroni 10.32 says, if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love God with all your might, what? mind and strength, then is His grace sufficient. But what I would say, Andrew, is that's an impossible gospel. Nobody can fulfill that. I, I, you know, I don't know you that well. I, I would assume that you probably haven't been perfect in your life. I, I would assume. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> right. Good. I, I'm glad we can fist bump over some uh, humility because I'm a sinner too. Uh, but I, I would even go so far as to say that, like, Elder Holland. I don't think he's denied himself of well and God in this as well. Right? I don't think Russell and Nelson has done it either. Well, our, our clergy never claimed to be perfect. Right. But according to this, you have to deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and then you get the grace. So the, the question is, how in the world is this possible? If this is true, how is it even obtainable? I, personally, I, I don't see a way to obtain it. Well, would you um, would you agree with the scripture in First Corinthians ten thirteen? Could you tell me what it says? It says, uh, "I'm going to put you in here, but God is faithful; and will not suffer you to take temptations above that you are able." So, I I'm going to you might disagree. I'm going to interpret that to mean that God essentially does not give us temptations or commandments that we cannot fulfill. Is that fair enough? Would you agree with that? Say that. God does not give us temptations that we can't overcome, nor commandments that we cannot fulfill. Okay. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and go back to, you know, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, be therefore perfect. I don't think he's talking about now, but I think as we repent, as we draw upon, you know, the merits of Christ, eventually, maybe not, not in this life, but we're going to be able to be perfect eventually. And, you know, I think that scripture, you can interpret the one in Moroni, we're not going to be, you know, if someone could, you know, do all this stuff, they'd essentially be perfect. Right. That might not come in this life, but God gave us the commandment to be perfect. And we can get there eventually, because Christ doesn't give us a possible path. So when you say eventually, are you talking about in the millennium, or what do you mean? No, I mean some point after this life. I don't know when I'm going to make it to perfection. Okay. So, Alma 34 comes to mind. When's the last time you read that? Not, not, not too long ago. Okay. It talks about the infinite and eternal atonement. You guys yeah, didn't yeah. take too much of an issue with that. I mean, well, it, God, had had to pay for our sins. God okay. had to pay for our sins, right? That Christ had to pay for our sins? Well, yeah, we, if you don't agree, well, I think that's the bare minimum for being called a Christian. Gotcha. I'm just reminded of this passage in Alma 34. I, I think it's super relevant to what you said. So, you, you can hold it, you can read it if you want. But my understanding of reading this text... Where did you get this one? This one's older. This is a, a 1970s one. It's really cool. It's my favorite edition of the Book of Mormon. I have, like... Nine different um, we can talk about that later if you want. Uh, but in Alma 34, what I understand it to be teaching, and I know that Spencer W. Kimball agrees with me on this, is that this life is the time to prepare. 
And, and like you were saying, that the Book of Mormon, but also the, I think the Doctrine and Covenants affirms that there is not a commandment that the Lord has given that we can't keep. So the implication is... Oh, you wouldn't you'd, you'd agree with that, would you? Well, God doesn't give us commandments we can't keep? So I, I would disagree in the sense that nobody has kept all the commandments. Nobody has, but it's possible to. No. I would say it's not possible because in James 2, verse 10, it says, For one who tries to keep the whole law, but they break any point of it, they're judged as being guilty of breaking the whole thing. And to give you an analogy, it's kind of like throwing a window, a rock at the window of a car. If you break it at any point, whether it's in the corner or right in the center, you've broken that window, period. That, that's how God regards sin. With respect. Regardless of how small that crack is, right. it's broken. Right. So it, well, there's certain, there's got to be degrees. I mean, murdering someone is a lot worse than, that's, you know, that's, you you know agree, yeah. We were accidentally hurting one of your yeah, guys. We, we would agree that certain sins are certainly more severe and have more impactful consequences immediately, like in, in this life, for sure. We would agree with that. We would also agree that you know, there's, there are certainly some sins that are going to warrant harsher punishment from God, you know, like torturing someone or raping them or killing them. Like, certainly we would have a point of, you know, common ground there where God hates those things, but it, it also says God hates liars, He hates schemers, He hates hypocrites, He hates the unrighteous. So God hates all sin. He, he's, not a, he's not partial in that He hates some sin less, it's that He hates all sin. And if you look at Revelation 21.8, it lists out a bunch of sins, and then it says these people are going to be perishing in the eternal flame. Right. And lying and murder are both in that same list. Yep. And I would agree that they're different. They're, they're both wrong, yeah. and God would agree that they're both wrong. That's why in the Old Testament you have different punishments for different crimes. Sure. But He pointed out that everyone in that group is going to be punished in, eternally right. in the fires. And so, right. And, and so important thing to, to consider. Kind of connect okay, so I, I, I think I can see where you're going. You're going sure. to say that there's a darkness wherein no labor can be performed. Right. And my response to that is, if you read up above a little bit, there's the if we do not improve. And so there's certain things we got to do here. Improve in this life? Yeah, certain. If we do not improve our time while in this life. Okay, so what does it mean a few verses later where it says, This is the final state of the wicked and Satan doth seal you? Well, you don't stay wicked if you repent. But according to Mormon doctrine, everyone is going to get the gospel and repent. So how, how No, it's still your choice. We, God gave us agency. That is one of the very few. We have choices. So, you know, it's not going to change. God has given us that now and forever. We're always going to have the right to choose. And so there are going to be some people who, for one reason or another, choose. Um, I mean, I'm sure you've seen people throughout your, your ministry who've seen some probably tremendous things and have decided not to follow Christ, even despite what they've seen. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think God is going to force people now or then any more than he is now. Okay. So you don't agree with Spencer... Uh, w. Kimball's take, where what that I'd says... I'd have to read up what, he, what he said. I don't know what you're uh, okay. referencing. Okay, so in, in the book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, have you ever read it? Yeah. Okay, so in The Miracle of Forgiveness, uh, he does talk about on the 34, because in that book, he, he hammers on sin and perfection and why it's important, keeping the commandments, and if we repent of sin, but then we go back to it, all of our previous sins that we committed come right back to us because we have no damage. Right? Do you, do you remember reading that in the book? I think so. I think uh, I'd have to go back and reread it. But, um, uh, that's all right. That's all right. Um, but also, and on the 34, he says, This life, because he quotes on the 34 in there, he says, This life is the time to do it. He, he says, Trying is weak. You must do it. He, he's a prophet, right? Well, so, so would you agree with him, or do you think that? with the priesthood that you have that you know better than the prophets here in Revelation. I'm having a hard time seeing what you're getting at. Uh, okay. What I'm asking is, uh, you have a different view than what Kimball had, but he was an oracle of the Lord, according to Mormonism, right? He was a prophet. He spoke with God. He wrote this book. But you disagree with what he said. So my, my question is, on what, a, 
On what authority do you reject Spencer W. Kimball's interpretation where he says, Alma 34 says, this life is the time, you don't get a chance in the next life? You, you, you'd have to read the whole book because, um, you know, he, ta he talks about how, you know, people always have a chance to, to come back. In, in this life, yes. But, but he doesn't affirm that for the next life. I'd, I'd have to go through and read okay. the book. Okay. That, that's fine. I was just curious what you thought about it. Because um, as Christians, we believe that this life is the only shot. And, and so the reason why I bring up Psalm 34 is I, I think that there is a point where it is correct. And that this is the one chance that we get. And so that, that's why if Mormonism is false, and, I, and we would contend you know, respectfully, but, but also humbly that it is, because it has a different God, a different way to God, and also even different eternal destinations. So it, it's a system that ultimately it doesn't save the patient. Rather, they unknowingly march the hell of the Bible in their hands because they know God. And, and that's what breaks our hearts for you. Is we, we believe that Joseph Smith gave a different idea of who God is to the world, and now there's 17 plus. 17 million plus Mormons, such as yourself, who believe it. And the, the issue is, Andrew, if you have the wrong Christ, if you believe in the Christ who is your elder brother, who's the brother of Satan, who didn't create everything, but is a created being, that's a false Christ. And it's the same false Christ as in uh, Siberia. There's a guy named Vasarion. He started a cult called the Church of the Last Testament. He claimed he's Jesus reincarnated. He's written a few books. Weiss did a documentary on him. It's really interesting. But he says he's Jesus. His followers truly believe he's Jesus. And they would condemn both of us as saying, we aren't following the true Jesus. But in the same way, we have to say, okay, we have three different ideas of who Jesus is. How do we figure it out? How do we you know, put it to the test and put the issue to rest? The issue is, we got to look at what the scriptures say. And the scriptures and the Bible teach Jesus is God eternal. He created everything, and everything is sustained through him. So he didn't organize matter. There weren't pre-existent intelligences that he just organized and then put in the bodies. That idea is foreign to the Bible, and that's what concerns us. Really. So I would love for you to take a track and read it, and you know, maybe come back and talk to us if you have some questions, or even if you find something that we're wrong about, we would love to you know, be corrected if we're incorrect. Is that something you'd be open to doing? <laughs> just to save by grace, you know, just to, you know, kind of see. Would that be all right? I think I'm going to have to go ahead and decline this book. Okay. Here's your book back. No um, worries. Well, thanks for talking with us. Appreciate it. It was Andrew, right? Yep. I, I, I wish, I, I know you guys are out for, I'd like to think we disagree, but, we, you know, we both allow each other that we're doing the best we can with what we know. And, you know, there, there is certainly a point where that's true, but there is a point, you know, where similar to the apostles in the New Testament, where they told the world the gospel and they told them to repent and believe. And in that same way, you know, with all of gentleness that, that I could muster up, Andrew, if, if you affirm Joseph's revelation about who God is, about your eternal destiny, the plan of salvation, if you affirm those things, you need to repent, and you need to believe in the true gospel, and the true Jesus of the Bible, and I would challenge you, go home and read the scriptures, go home and read John 1, go home and read Colossians 1, and then read the first three chapters of uh, Romans, if you're open to it, maybe even Isaiah uh, 40 through 44, where uh, those chapters speak of the exclusivity of God, there's only one God, you're never going to become a God. You, and I don't know if you're married, you and your wife or your future wife, you will never have, you know, your own eternal possibility. It's not in the cards. Scripture disallows those possibilities. So, you know, all the things you're striving for, it's in vain. I don't want that for you. So, you know, I love you. I would challenge you as a fellow brother and man. Repent and turn to Christ and give you life. And I know that that's probably going to sound harsh or, like, weird because... You already profess a belief in Christ, but my friend it has a false Christ, so he can't say it. I'm going to go ahead and say that uh, I'm confident enough in my beliefs not to be afraid. Okay. Have a good night. Have a good one.